art song as a Latin American and U.S. genre. Five representative works by Roberto Sierra. I've been working on this project for a little over a year now, and I'm thrilled to share a portion of my doctoral research with you tonight. The QR code that you scanned upon entry gives you access to a handout with all tables and musical examples that I will be referencing throughout the presentation. Feel free to refer back to that document if I have already moved forward in the slideshow and you need more time to process something. Before we begin, here is an overview of what I will be covering. First, I will establish the research problem, purpose, and significance of this study. Next, I will go over some brief background on Puerto Rican history and trends in classical music. Our composer of interest, Roberto Sierra, is then introduced, providing some basic biographical information, framing key elements of his compositional style, and explaining the breadth of his contribution to the art song genre as an exemplar of what I will explain to be Puerto Rican post-nationalism. Finally, I will alternate discussing my analysis of five of Mr. Sierra's song cycles with performances of selected songs with Dr. Andrea Mutz. Wrapping up with the conclusion of my findings and a proposal of where I think this research needs to go next. Even though Puerto Ricans have been recognized as American citizens since 1917, there is a lack of representation of their art song repertoire in the U.S. classical music scene. Instead, we tend to think of composers like Samuel Barber, Amy Beach, Aaron Copeland, and Charles Ives when programming American song. Admittedly, there is limited accessibility to the Puerto Rican art song canon, as many works by deceased composers are either out of print or housed solely in the library of the Conservatory of Music in San Juan. That said, classical song literature by living, post-nationalist Puerto Rican composers is widely available and Roberto Sierra is perhaps the most prolific of his generation today. Examining five of his Spanish language cycles will help to contribute to scholarly discourse on diversifying classical repertoire, which has thankfully become an expectation of modern audiences. When Christopher Columbus arrived in Puerto Rico, then called Oigen, in 1493, the Spaniards encountered the native Taino people, who have a musical culture dating back over 1,500 years. Music and dance were an integral aspect of everyday life, primarily serving religious purposes, but also used as a form of entertainment and as a means of commemorating victories in battle. The Spaniards seized control of Oiken and educated the indigenous people in both the Spanish language and the Catholic religion. Music proved to be a helpful conversion tool, introducing the natives to choral music and a variety of instruments. During this time, the Spanish friars also learned about the Taino culture, whereby, quote, an exchange between cultures started to take place, eventually resulting in new, mixed, syncretic music styles, autochthonous to the island, end quote. Within 100 years, the Taino population began to dwindle due to disease, along with poor living and working conditions. As a result, the Spaniards brought West African slaves to Puerto Rico, and much like the indigenous population, music and dance pervaded their lives. The West African musical tradition was rhythmically complex, percussive, and featured call and response singing, eventually blending with elements of Spanish music and developing into two folk traditions known as bomba and plena. Throughout the Spanish colonial period, which, la uh, which lasted until the conclusion of the Spanish-American War in 1898, Puerto Ricans engaged with popular Spanish cultural traditions, which gradually evolved into new, distinctly Puerto Rican forms. Just as music and dance from the Dainos, Spaniards, and Africans have combined over the years, the same process has inspired the idiosyncrasies of the Puerto Rican dialect of Spanish, Puerto Rican cuisine, and the physical makeup of the Puerto Rican people. After over 400 years of Spanish rule, the United States seized control of Puerto Rico at the turn of the 20th century. Thus, Puerto Ricans faced an identity crisis which, quote, implies the formulation of a local self as distinct from the image of the other, embodied in this case by the U.S., in ways it is applied as a political, economical, and cultural force over local lifestyles, end quote. This led to a period of nationalism, whereby various aspects of culture were reevaluated, especially music and dance. One of the prominent leaders of this movement was composer Hector Campos Parsi, who studied with Nadia Boulanger in Paris. 
During the 1940s and 50s, he and his contemporaries sought to develop an identifiably Puerto Rican style of classical music that was modeled after 19th century European forms and compositional techniques. While composers of this period drew on melodic and rhythmic patterns from folk music in their works, the cost was the suppression of the dance component of indigenous musics in order to promote a serious, listenable genre for the concert hall. These composers also denied seeking any influence from music of the United States, such as the growing genre of jazz. Regarding vocal music, the vast majority of works were based on texts by Puerto Rican nationalist writers who emphasized the beauty of the island and aspects of daily life in various cities like San Juan and Aguadilla. Following that period, quote, Puerto Rican nationalism found its antithesis in Rafael Aponte Lede's new music, end quote. Aponte Lede and his contemporaries of the 1960s belonged to a new generation of composers who were no longer concerned with contributing to a national style, instead focusing on contemporary compositional techniques. Additionally, an increasing number of Puerto Ricans had settled in New York City by this point, known as New Yorkans. So U.S. and Puerto Rican culture were no longer mutually exclusive. The scope of available musical materials to Puerto Rican composers then was much broader, including jazz, as well as indigenous music and dance forms that the nationalists had disregarded. The selection of poetry and vocal music also expanded to writers from outside the island. Composers from this period of Puerto Rican post-nationalism were, and still are, more interested in upsetting the balance of what constituted serious music, and Puerto Rican music as a whole, for that matter. Roberto Sierra is of a newer generation of Puerto Rican post-nationalist composers and is actively composing song literature to this day. He was born in 1953 and is one of the most prolific living Puerto Rican composers of art music, having written over 250 works for orchestra, wind ensemble, chorus, keyboard, and various chamber ensembles. His Misa Latina for chorus, soloist, and symphony orchestra has been lauded as, quote, the most significant symphonic premiere in Washington, D.C. since Benjamin Britten's War Requiem, end quote. Originally from Vega Baja, Puerto Rico, and now an emeritus professor of composition at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, Sierra's formal studies began in Puerto Rico, and he eventually went to study abroad in Europe most notably with Jerzy Ligeti between 1979 and 1982. Through this experience, Sierra absorbed aspects of European avant-gardism, which he then fused with the musical talent from his upbringing to create a unique compositional style. Over the course of his career, he has frequently published art songs, now boasting a list of 20 solo vocal works. Despite his extensive contribution to the repertoire over the past 40 years, Scholarly activity concerning this portion of Sierra's output is virtually non-existent today, hence the importance of the present study. His song cycles exhibit a penchant for unresolved dissonances, polytonality and tonal ambiguity, additive harmony, use of extreme ranges on the piano, Caribbean rhythmic patterns, and freer formal structures. Additionally, although he has set texts from the Puerto Rican nationalist canon, Sierra's chosen texts are quite diverse. He claims to write songs based on the poetry that piques his interest at the time of composition, and his mission is no more complicated than that. The works are truly reflective of a man who is fascinated with other cultures and considers himself equally Puerto Rican and American. Here are a few notable quotes from interviews that help to further understand Sierra's perspective and approach to composition. Quote, in Puerto Rico, we have a strong folk and popular music background. This I've heard all my life. It's very rich rhythmically and harmonically as well. It was part of my upbringing to hear this music, and since I started composing, well, not in the beginning since I was studying the European tradition, but afterwards when I realized that this background was a part of what I am, it sort of came into my music very strongly. It might not be through direct quotations or whatever you like, but basically the essence is there. It's like a subliminal current that goes on all the time, like a voice with a rhythmic passage that's very familiar, end quote. Sierra clarifies this statement in a later interview, saying, quote, This does not imply that I limit myself to making popular or folk music, since I look towards European modernism with the idea of digesting and transforming it based on that tropical memory. End quote. 
Although he does not consider his music to be definitively avant-garde, like that of Vigety, Sierra asserts, quote, I don't run from anything, neither of dissonance nor of rhythmic complexity. Everything that is useful to me when expressing ideas becomes a means of my language, end quote. It becomes increasingly apparent when considering the vast range of source material Sierra draws upon in his vocal works, leading to a continually evolving style. Of his relationship to Puerto Rico and the greater US, Sierra states, quote, for me, it was always important to have that element that represents who I am and where I come from in a very specific manner. Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, and also part of a larger American culture, which is not just one thing. I think it has different ramifications. In a way, it's like a circle that has a circle around it that has a circle around it, but at the center is what I call the internal locus. So for me, from the very beginning, that sense of identification was very important." End quote. This is why it is difficult to group Sierra's works with other Puerto Rican composers of his same generation. A hallmark of post-nationalist music is the degree of synthesis with other styles and techniques outside of the island is unique to each composer and their lived experience. Thus, the presence and means of transformation of Puerto Rican elements has become an identifiable feature. The following tables list Sierra's full output of solo vocal literature, and I have highlighted the song cycles we will be focusing on in green. In a similar vein to predecessor of Ponte Lede, who has sometimes set texts by Puerto Rican poets and includes uh, quotations of traditional music in his works, Sierra uses this material, but is also open to inspiration from other cultures and time periods, now having written cycles that represent six cultures and three languages, including three Spanish dialects. You'll notice when I sing tonight that my approach to the Spanish pronunciation will change throughout. I don't have time to discuss this, but if you read my dissertation, you'll learn all about it. Um, so all of these works are available for purchase through the Subito Music Corporation. Now, we get to experience what this music actually looks and sounds like. I've provided an overview table of each song cycle and highlighted the songs we will be focusing on in green. Nonetheless, I thought it was important for you to see the full context of each work. Sierra's first song cycle, Conjuros, or Conjurations, was written in 1982 and first published in 2006. In Sierra's words, quote, the melodies are based on traditional Afro-Cuban ritual songs that were brought from Africa by the slaves that were forced into captivity and brought to the Caribbean island. The actual words are phonetic translations of what were initially African words that time has transformed into enigmatic syllables that are impossible to translate." End quote. He later explains that the basic materials of these chants are derived from Mukumi rituals and that many of the words serve a rhythmic purpose for dance or meditation rather than comprising intelligible speech. His goal in writing Conjuros was to recontextualize fragments of indigenous music from his perspective instead of making an arrangement of something that already existed. Thus, this was a project in synthesizing the contemporary with the traditional. Conjuros consists of seven short songs and a full performance lasts approximately ten and a half minutes. Sierra tends to employ modality and additive harmony throughout, yielding an overarching atmosphere of mysticism. The last song, Ejesi, is the only one to end with a definitive tonic, thus showing that there is delayed resolution throughout the cycle. Cyclical unity is achieved, especially with the punctuated minor ninth motive introduced in the piano at the beginning of the first song, which returns to signal the final phrase of Ejesi. Sierra defaults to through composed forms in all the songs except for O Jaja Lumba Lumba perhaps indicative of the improvisatory nature of these indigenous dances and chants. Other notable compositional features include polyrhythmic counterpoint, a propensity for folk-like parallel fifths, metrical freedom, call and response relationship between the voice and piano, and ostinati built on traditional Caribbean rhythmic cells. Although information on the source material for this cycle is sparse, Sierra does explain how during the first song, quote, in the dialect of the Congo Mayombe, a sorcerer instructs the spirit of a dead person to do certain tasks." End quote. The energetic and syncopated nature of both the vocal line and piano throughout implies that chanting, dancing, and drumming are occurring in tandem. Most of Ojaja Lumba Lumba 
is supported with a consistent Caribbean presillo pattern in the bass line. It goes like this. This becomes increasingly complex and polyrhythmic, especially with a new layer of triplet drumming appearing for the song's climax, which you can see in measures 27 through 28. The third song, Chamalongo, is underpinned with an habanera ostinato, which goes like, Anyone who's seen Carmen before knows what that sounds like. Um, this is made especially sensual with Sierra's continual chromatic motion between A flat and A natural. The character of this one seems more contemplative than it does active. That said, the text repetition could imply that some sort of incantation is paired with the slow, fluid dance. As the song progresses, a new melody is introduced in the soprano line of the piano. Its irregular syncopations and blue notes adding an element of United States jazz to an otherwise Puerto Rican musical experience. Of all the selections in Bajuros, Ecue exhibits immediately recognizable spell casting music. For this song, Sierra creates an ostinato uh, out of the Hungarian note, resulting in two melodic augmented seconds. The added space between scale degrees 6 and 7 of the harmonic minor scale is a known signifier of musical exoticism or mysticism, so the addition of a sharp scale degree 4 takes that notion a step further. The composer asks that the ostinato be played como bruma, or like mist, which I see as a fitting backdrop for the sorcerer to concentrate on invoking the supernatural. Conjuros concludes with a third depiction of ritual dancing and drumming this time set to a grooving amphibrach. It goes like this. This pattern is passed between the piano and vocal lines, another example of the way Sierra uses text to serve rhythmic purposes. Elements of previous movements return, such as the repeated G minor scales, this time harmonic minor, uh, from Ecue, and the angular minor ninth motive from Oja Da Lumba Lumba. After six previous songs that evaded closure with half cadences and added dissonances, AJC concludes on a convincing G natural tonic. That said, the unison final chord and the absence of a leading tone in the vocal line's resolution helps to maintain a feeling of open-endedness. I think this is appropriate given the cyclical nature of rituals. Even though these acts may have had finality in and of themselves, it is likely that they were often revisited at various times of year for different purposes.
second song cycle for voice and piano, Cinco Poemas Aztecas, or Five Aztec Poems, was written and published in 1994. The poetry is taken from an anonymous source, translated from Nahuatl, the native language of Central Mexico, to Spanish. Sierra's choice to explore and engage with a culture quite different from his own through this work is another nod to his position among the Puerto Rican post-nationalist composers. In brief, the Aztec Empire lasted from 1428 to 1519 and was one of the most advanced civilizations of its time. From their complex system of aqueducts, race farming technology, and craft, craft specialization, to intricate social and political structures that spanned hundreds of city-states, scholars continue to marvel at the dynamism of what the Aztecs developed. They also cultivated a love for music, dance, and poetry, which became an integral part of ceremonies, religious events, and public entertainment. Unfortunately, this quickly ended when Hernando Cortes and his Spanish army reached present-day Mexico in 1519. Over the course of two years, the Spaniards conquered the Aztec Empire through Christian conversion, warfare, and smallpox, eventually gaining full control of the capital city, Tenochtitlan. Thankfully, the Aztecs' innovation is still felt as a strong presence in Mexican society, despite their short rule and untimely end. Cinco Poemas Aztecas consists of five songs, and the full performance lasts approximately 13 minutes. The Aztecs used a combination of drums, fifes, flutes, and conches in their music making, and Sierra seems to reflect that in his contrast between contrapuntal and homophonic textures in the piano parts. Following the free verse construction of the poetry, all the songs are through composed, and none of them end with a convincing harmonic resolution. Each song is rather independent and unchronological from one to the next, but Sierra does achieve some cyclical unity with an arpeggiated quintuplet motive that appears in the second, fourth, and fifth numbers. It could be interpreted as a recurring omen of the civilization's fall. Despite the uplifting context of most of the poetry, Sierra's reading has a penchant for keeping that dark, dramatic irony as a through line. Other notable compositional features include extensive polytonality, dissonant chromaticism, polyrhythmic counterpoint, submerged Caribbean rhythmic cells, and a relatively high vocal testatura. The third song, Poema de la Conquista, or Poem of the Conquest, is the crux of Cinco Poemas Aztecas, and delivered from the perspective of a survivor. Although it is through composed, Sierra divides the poem into two distinct parts, a fast, percussive section for the description of the Aztecs' barbaric massacre, and a slow, almost hypnotic section for the reflection on all that was lost. The first half is unquestionably atonal and chromatic, an appropriate choice for the chaos of unexpected warfare. Then, the contrast that Sierra accomplishes at the arrival of the second half, Marta Doloroso, or painfully, is striking. Now, in A minor, with sophisticated triplet polyrhythm, one can still perceive the modernity of the Aztec civilization, now viewed through the lens of complete anguish. La Mistad, or Friendship, returns to a poem that was likely written before the conquest. Musings on flowers, birdsong, and feathers from herons and quetzals, this song is the most consonant of the cycle, containing only a few instances of musical foreboding. Sierra sets the text in a bright E lydian with a complex contrapuntal relationship between the piano and vocal lines. This is maintained throughout the song because the poetry speaks of how friendship quivers and interlaces itself between two people, a brilliant example of the effectiveness of text painting. Oh! <laughs> 
published in 1999, Rimas, or Rhymes, is the last song cycle for voice and piano that Sierra composed during the 20th century. It is based on the writings of Gustavo Adolfo Becker, one of the most celebrated Spanish poets of all time. Born into a family of painters, Becker began his artistic journey as a 3D artist and painter before eventually finding his way to writing, which he considered to be his true calling. He had a high respect for poetry and was continually in pursuit of adequately expressing what he would realize is indescribable, his fascination with light. During his short life, Becker wrote 76 poems called Rimas, which were all published posthumously. They are each given Roman numerals as titles and cover a wide range of moods and tones. However, all of the Rimas are written from a first-person perspective, Becker's presumably. Uh, and often address a second person using the Spanish informal tu, which means you, instead of the more formal vosotros. This is important to note because it implies that Becker anthropomorphized his quest for light as a familiar and likely romantic relationship. Sierra's Rimas consists of five songs, and the full performance lasts approximately nine minutes. Most of these are settings of short poems, four to five lines in length, uh, and even though the cycle is a foretaste of Becker's aesthetic, Sierra manages to capture some of the major themes with his selection. Namely, one will see that, quote, Becker's notion of poetry is his conviction that it exists apart from and independent of both the poet and the poem, end quote. In Sierra's songs, I envision the singer as Becker's yo, or I, the poet, uh, the poem as an intermediary, and the piano as his tu, which could mean Thus, the vocal and piano lines maintain equal importance and a conversational relationship across all five songs, resulting in the only noticeable source of cyclical unity. It is as if Sierra aimed to compose the full picture of Becker's thoughts as he was writing poetry. The piano serves to fill in the gaps of inexpressible responses from the universe, and the overarching avant-garde approach of Sierra's style here makes those responses ever more fleeting. In addition to tonal ambiguity, evocations of improvisation, and spontaneous changes of texture, other notable compositional features include submerged Caribbean rhythmic cells and floral vocal writing. To begin the journey into Becker's mind, the first poem of Sierra's Rimas is Que es Poesia, or What is Poetry? A short and contemplative piece that arrives to the simple answer of you. Becker once wrote that you refers to the womanly form which, quote, apart from its beauty, has in its makeup something of primitive harmony and uh, mystery, of feeling, hope, and eternity, end quote. Aptly, Sierra sets this text in the austere Phrygian mood, which is, a no which is known to invoke antiquity, such as Greek architecture and sculpture. The song maintains an air of mysticism, passing scalar passages between the vocal and piano lines in an improvisatory manner that shows Becker's inner monologue. In the next song, Por una mirada, or a glance, the poet is in an optimistic state of mind, relaying how he would give his beloved the world for her to glance at him, and the sky for her to smile. He is so overwhelmed at the thought of a kiss that he doesn't know what he would offer in return. Sierra thus sets this text as a sprightly dance. Taken from his Puerto Rican background, he employs the Caribbean technique of vertical hemiola at various points, in which patterns from 3 4, or 1 2, 1 2, 1 2, 1 2, 1 2, 1 2, are layered on top of or below patterns from 6 8, like 1 2, 3, 1 2, 3, 1 2, 3, 1 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 which you can see up here in measure 15. Los suspiros son aire, or sighs are air, once again addresses a woman. Over the course of this poem, the poet is able to reason how sighs and tears eventually go to places of seemingly limitless matter, the air and the sea. What he cannot figure out, however, is where lost love ends up, and he is left in frustration. Sierra's treatment of this text is not a tonal per se, but it shifts tonal centers spontaneously, propelled forward with an abundance of trills and other florid figures in both the piano and vocal lines. This is undoubtedly a depiction of wind, which, like light, is ever-changing, unpredictable, and impossible to capture. 
It has been discussed how Becker, quote, conceived of poetry as a fleeting and unapproachable entity, end quote, to which he humbly dedicated his life. But he also saw, quote, the poet as a desperate human being whose mission is destined to fail, end quote. Highlighting this fatalistic view, Sierra finishes Avimas with Mi vida es un area, or My life is a wasteland. Uh, continuing that back up from the previous song, and now fully atonal, the piano melody appears random and unrelated to the vocal line. Uh, here, the poet is purportedly a bringer of death, and something in the universe intends for bad things to happen to him, regardless of his best efforts. Unsurprisingly, the cycle is left unresolved, just as Becker never saw the publication of his work before his premature death from tuberculosis.
During the second decade of the 21st century, Sierra wrote three song cycles for voice and piano based on Puerto Rican nationalist poetry. The first of these is Decimas, a selection of poems of the same name by Luis Torres Torres, published in 2013. Luis Torres Torres assumed a dual career as a writer and lawyer. He used both of these platforms to express his desire for Puerto Rican independence, a cause to which he would dedicate the remainder of his life through rhetoric, rhetoric and activism. His poetry, therefore, often describes the beauty of the island and simple pleasures of rural life. The effect is one of harkening back to times prior to the U.S. occupation of 1898, rather than expressing a radical stance. Curiously, these ideals tend to look toward, quote, Spain as a spiritual fount, cultural wellspring, and racial motherland, end quote, despite the Puerto Rican people's equally prominent Taino and African roots. One of the cultural items Puerto Rico inherited from Spain was the decima poetic structure, a ten-line stanza with eight syllables per line and an A, B, B, A, A, C, D, D, C rhyme scheme. This has transformed over time, and Llorenz Torres' decimas are no exception. He wrote 16 total, most of which are inspired by Puerto Rican folklore and images of the landscape. In the folk music tradition, these are often sung in free rhythm and accompanied by a cuatro, which is a guitar-like instrument with four strings. Uh, these play interludes between each textual statement. Art song settings prior to Sierra's exist too, however. Given Llorenz Torres' popularity, especially among the nationalist composers of the 1940s and 50s, Many of these poems have been interpreted for piano and voice by Hector Campos Parsi, Narciso Figueroa, Luis Antonio Ramirez, and Ernesto Cordero, among others. Sierra's Decimas consists of seven songs, and a full performance lasts approximately 12 minutes. Compared to the three works discussed previously, these songs instantly come across as more friendly to the untrained ear, comprised of simpler tonalities and harmonic structures, as well as recognizable forms in most cases. Sierra has ordered the selection of poetry to tell the story of one's journey through a day in Puerto Rico. In a similar manner to Conjuros, his treatment of rhythm is what comes to the forefront in Decimas, often building ostinati from traditional Caribbean rhythmic cells that evoke dancing. This is important to note, since the patterns are largely Afro-Cuban in origin, even though Llorenz Torres, his rhetoric, does not speak to that aspect of Puerto Rican cultural development. I see Sierra's reading, therefore, as a recontextualization of long-revered poetry from his perspective of what it means to be Puerto Rican 100 years later. In Amanecer, which means dawn, the sun is shining and the narrator is overcome by the beauty of the mountain, river, and meadow. Additionally, a rooster announces that a new day has begun. Sierra employs a few different Caribbean rhythms in this joyful dance, including Brasil. It is crucial to di di differentiate this pattern from straight quarter note triplets, which are close, but not the same. Um, this is important because Sierra also uses both vertical and horizontal key viola, wherein 3, 4, and 6, 8 patterns are sometimes layered, as in measures 7 and 8, uh, in addition to alternating sequentially between measures, as in measures 9 through 11. In the folk tradition, this is a very common feature of decima accompaniments. Taking place at two in the morning, copla lejana, or distant ballad, is essentially one stream of consciousness, consciousness while trying to fall asleep. Despite the asymmetrical time signature, Sierra emphasizes a folk-like simplicity in this song uh, with pentatonic melodic patterns in the vocal line and abundant parallel fifth motion in the piano part. To signal each pleasant change of thought and observations in the night sky, his tonal plan unfolds as follows. D major, G major, A flat major, A minor, and concluding in C major. The final song of Decimas, Vida Criolla, or Creole Life, functions as the conclusion of everything that was conveyed in the previous six numbers. In short, regardless of life's occasional misfortunes, there is nothing better than being Puerto Rican. Sierra introduces a driving recio ostinato immediately, which he then juxtaposes with a 3-2 clave pattern in the vocal line. He uses this to signal the arrival of strong cadences. 
He also reuses the subtext of the initial exclamation I from the poetry to develop an introductory, intermediary, and conclusionary theme for the voice. This gives the singer an opportunity to express growing excitement over the course of the song without the need for words, eventually terminating the cycle on the highest sung note and the perfect authentic cadence.
The final work in this study, Julia, was written and published in 2015. Sierra explores the poetry of Julia de Burgos, whom Luis Llorenz Torres praised for, quote, the exceptional caliber and promise of her lyric endowment, end quote. Growing up southeast of San Juan in a family of 15, de Burgos developed a mindset of independence and resilience from an early age. She earned an education degree from the University of Puerto Rico and began her career teaching elementary school. Meanwhile, de Burgos became an active member of the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party and started writing and publishing poetry, quickly garnering acclaim for her talent. She would later move to Havana, New York, and Washington, D.C. over the course of two unsuccessful marriages before settling in New York for the remainder of her life. There, de Burgos worked as a journalist and continued to write poetry, both in Spanish and English. Much of her work from that period discusses the difficult and often lonely life of an immigrant, which would serve as an inspiration to other New Yorican poets in the generation following her. Sadly, her later years saw a descent into unemployment, poor health, and alcoholism. De Burgos eventually became so depressed and disconnected from her peers and her once flourishing artistic life that she died as an unidentified woman in Harlem Hospital after being found unconscious on the streets of New York. Although her publications fell into obscurity during the last half of the 20th century, scholarship on De Burgos' poetry has gained traction in the past few decades. Over the course of her short life, de Burgos wrote 203 poems, many of which were not published until just recently. They cover a broad range of topics, including romance, nationalism, nature, feminism, and anti-racism, a testament to her forward thinking and often controversial views of the time. Before Sierra, the only known composer to set de Burgos' poetry was Leonard Bernstein, with A Julia de Burgos, which is the third movement of his 1977 cycle Songfest. Julia consists of six songs, and a full performance lasts approximately 17 minutes. Sierra has selected text from various phases of de Burgos' output that show thematic changes based on what she was likely experiencing at the time. This cycle is the longest, rangiest, and most orchestral in scope of the five discussed, making it most appropriate for an advanced singer with a fuller voice. In many ways, the movements are reminiscent of uh, Henri Ducarc's treatment of the art song as an operatic shana. Whereas previous songs by Sierra often evoke dancing and percussive elements through Caribbean rhythmic patterns, whether obvious or submerged, Julia takes a different approach, uh, practically abandoning this trend altogether. These poems are highly personal and pensive, and Sierra honors that through an exclusively syllabic text setting and the use of recitative. Other notable features include piano writing on three staves, evocations of birdsong, formal structures that align with the poetry, and a marked increase in tempo changes and flexibility. O Pajaro de Amor, or O Bird of Love, brings a flute-like melody to the forefront with virtuosic arpeggiations and scalar patterns in the upper octaves of the piano. This illustrates the object of the narrator's predicament. De Burgos was single and rather isolated during her later years, and this poem seems to describe the bird of love as a frustrating reminder that past relationships did not work out. Essentially, the bird is teasing her. The song grows in intensity until forward momentum stops altogether for a dissonant recitative on why am I at the whim of sobs without your flutter. Ignoring her cries, the bird shortly resumes its twittering, as if to say these feelings will never go away. The last song of Julia, Canción Hacia Adentro, or Inward Song, is commanded with three punctuated statements of don't remember me, feel me. Using nature symbolism, it seems the narrator is bargaining with a lover who wants their relationship to end. She is resolute that her passion can fix any wrongdoings or negative thought. Mindful of de Burgos' verse and refrain structure, Sierra applies a rondo form to this song. Each section flows into the next without a strong cadence. Instead, resolutions are approached and then evaded each time, as with the final E natural in each C minor vocal refrain, which you can see in the final measure of that example. I see this as evocative of the narrator's lover refusing to respond to her petitions. What is more, it speaks to de Burgos' unfortunate demise 
and virtual anonymity leading up to her death.
To conclude, this study of Umberto Sierra's art song literature demonstrates how composers of Puerto Rican classical music have joined in the increasingly universal fascination with exploring new technical conventions, engaging with other cultures, and reevaluating the relationship between music and identity. Due to the integration of text and music in local works, this is ever more apparent, helping to redefine Puerto Rico's position as both a part of Latin America and the United States. It would be beneficial to increase the breadth of this study in the future, examining the art songs of other post-nationalist Puerto Rican composers, like Ernesto Cordero, Raymond Torres Santos, and Carlos E. Vasquez. Recently, a growing number of articles, books, and conference presentations from the vocal pedagogy community are calling for a reassessment of the classical repertoire, especially its underrepresentation of BIPOC, Latinx, and women composers. Modern audiences are also becoming increasingly interested in performances that reflect the diversity of our world. The present study is now part of this collective dialogue and call for meaningful change, shedding light on composers who are still living and creating to this day. May this serve as a small step toward Puerto Rican art song and American art song, each being considered a part of the same canon. Thank you again for attending tonight, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you so much.